Hey, it's Wanchaloa here for another video. Uh, I'm probably releasing this uh, when I'm not here because I'm away <laughs> in June. I had some stuff going on, some training I got to do. Anyways, I wanted to, I would meaning to actually do this, guys, is uh, read my article, The Racist Origin of Mixed Race in Central and South America, um, basically in an audiobook format, but I'm going to provide some commentary too. Um, a lot of the times, people think that what we're saying, we're just pulling straight out of our butt. <laughs> and it's not like, uh, I got this article published, but I have scholarly sources cited, which I'll mention there at the end, um, to everything that I'm saying. Basically, I read like, I think like three or four books to synthesize this one article. It took a lot of time. So without further ado, I'm just going to go ahead and narrate it for you guys. So the racist origin of mixed race in Central and South America. All right. Many of my fellow Native Americans from south of the U.S. border suffer from an identity crisis when I reveal the truth of their race. Many Hispanics and Latinx, I say Latinx to make fun of it, I know it's Latinx, are Native American. This has been acknowledged by past historical figures. Take note of Thomas Jefferson's letter to Alexander von Humboldt in April 1811 regarding Mexicans. All former Spanish colonies are now in insurrection. What kind of government will they establish? Have they mind enough to place their domesticated Indians on a footing with the whites? History of Mexico, page 23. This is a speech to Congress on January 4th, 1848 by Senator John C. Calhoun, opposing the All Mexico Plan following the Mexican-American War. To incorporate Mexico would be the very first instance of the kind of incorporating an Indian race. For more than half of the Mexicans are Indians and the other is composed chiefly of mixed tribes. I protest against such a union as that. Our, sir, is the government of a white race. And then a statement from U.S. diplomat Wadey Thompson, Jr. in 1836. The Indian race of Mexico must recede before us is quite certain as that is the destiny of our own Indian Indians. That's from the Indigenous People's History of the United States, page 117. So what's interesting is that I would say 150 years ago, or a little, you know, definitely 200 years ago, the subject or debate whether Mexicans or, or Central and South Americans or any of these people south of the border are Native American, that was not a debate. That was a fact. That was known. That wasn't, uh, there's no brought up of, oh, we're mestizo, you're mixed, you're not 100, you're Hispanic, Latin. None of this stuff existed back then. Um, well, I mean, like his, Hispanic, well, not Hispanic, but Latino did because there was a French, uh, I think noble or French philosopher that coined the term to try to like uh, get uh, indigenous people to subscribe to that notion to basically unite with French. That's back when uh, they sent Maximilian down here to be a French emperor in Mexico. That's where the word originates from. I need to brush up more on that history. It's been a while since I read it, but that's where the origin comes from. It's not something that indigenous peoples created or that Mexicans created themselves. It came from Europe, but this whole debate that we've been doing on the podcast is, was never a thing back in the day. Um, <clears throat> so we'll continue. The subject of racial identity shocks people of Native American descent from south of the U.S. border. Many vehemently argue others embrace it and almost all yearn to know more. A common protest is the fact that we are mixed or mestizo or that some of us has very little Native DNA. However, the concept of being mixed is a foreign European one that stems from the race of Spanish caste system. It was not self-imposed by our native ancestors. This was implemented not only in Mexico, but in other Central and South American countries during colonial times. Despite, despite dismantling the native empires of Mexico, the Spanish were still vastly outnumbered by a native population. And here's a map showing just in Mexico of all these tribes. And there's mine, the Guachichil. <laughs> Anyways, because of the shortage of white Spanish women, Spanish men initially re reproduced with natives and later blacks. This produced mixed children. The Spanish fathers in these relationships faced a choice regarding the future treatment and status of their offspring. If the Spaniard accepted the child as legitimate, the child would be considered white despite the biracial appearance and would hold the status of a white person. In effect, the child would become part of the Creole elite. At the beginning of colonialism, this term embodied white people that were born in the Indies. It later evolved to mean a white person with little native DNA. Ultimately, accepting legitimate mixed children bolstered the ranks of the white class, which benefited them more as more people were needed to govern the land. If the Spanish father rejected his offspring, the child would be sent to an indigenous community to live as any full-blooded native and be accepted there. However, this, this system proved to be problematic. Rebellions and conspiracies spawned 
against the colonial government from these mixed children of the year, threatening the colonial elites. Due to this, in the 1570s to 15, uh, or 1540s to 1570s, the Spanish created the label of mestizo or mixed, which became synonymous with being illegitimate. Mestizos were unequal to white people and not to be trusted fully in the colonies. One thing I want to throw out there um, also is mestizo literally means half breed, like a horse, like an animal, you know. So to be wanting to call yourself a half breed is not good. There's other two. There's two other words for mix in Spanish. I don't see why people never use them. It's called mixto or mezclado, but yet everyone subscribes to being called half breed, and they subscribe to half breedery. It makes no sense. Um, and no, I'm not pulling that out my ass. But I mean that does come from translators have used those online, but I've used official translators for Mexico that grew up there, that were educated there, and they say the same thing. Mestizo means half-breed. That is the translation for it. The Mestizo, Mestizo label had roots on the Iberian Peninsula with the concept known as limpieza de sangre. The Spanish desire to eradicate the Moors and stop the spread of Judaism in the 15th and 16th centuries. In contrast, society's classes were racial in the colonies. In Spain, they were delineated de by religion. The further one's ancestral lineage from Muslim or Jew, the better. This limpieza de sangre concept provided the caste template for hybridity in the colonies regarding race. Uh, that's Ben Vincent on page 43. Uh, this is from the book uh, Before Mestizaje. It's a scholarly work on this whole mestizo um, concept and origination consequences and how it evolved over time. So I highly recommend that you guys read that. Indeed, those called mestizo in Spain were described as Christian in name and Muslim in heart. So as you can see, mestizo originated first in Spain, and it was really for to delineate those of different religions, whether they were Jews and Muslims or, or pure Christians. And then it got applied to the colonies racially. Okay, so that's where it, it, it first, uh, you know, entered the scene, right? The issue in Spain continued to fester. The Moriscos, which is a full-blooded white person, and a mulata, which is a half black person, equals a morisco. A moreno or black person plus a full-blooded white person um, is a equals a mulata, right? So they rebelled against the Spanish crown in the middle of the 17th century in the Alpujarras region, while strife continued in New Spain, the pre-Mexican region. This aggravated the situation because the colonial government saw the conflicts as connected. Given them reinforced costs to implement this mestizo term to derank their offspring and other mixed individuals. And here's the Alchaparas region. And here is a picture of the caste system. This is pretty iconic. If you, if you have uh, done any research with mestizaje, the caste system, any of that crap, um, you'll have come across this. If there, if there wasn't a lot happening already, there had been an in exponential increase of black slaves surging into New Spain. In the mid 16th century, the number of black e blacks equals the number of whites at roughly 20,000 in 1550 to 1560. And this plurality continued to grow over many decades. The colonial government feared the union of natives, mestizos, and blacks into an insurmountable rebellion that would displace them. So they opted to fully implement a caste system to sow division, maintain control, all right? Though quite complex and organized and extreme, the caste system's first was purpose was to place full-blooded white Europeans at the top of the social ladder and all other groups at the bottom. The closer a group's proximity to whiteness, the greater its individual status. It opened special privileges, advancement, and wealth potential. At the very bottom were blacks and full-blooded natives. Above them were the mestizos, the mixed children of whites and natives. Above them were the castizos, the progeny of a mestizo and a white person. It went on and on with many combinations possible. This created a split between the groups and the beginning of a racist framework that affects Mexican society to this day. Currently, indigenous groups in Mexico are discriminated against by white Europeans and mestizo populations. The Spaniards created a self-sustaining system for their continuous racial dominance that has far outlived their rule. Makes natives subjugate full-blooded natives doing much of the dirty work for majority white elites. There are also more subtle forms of racism with many actors, TV anchors, et cetera, being predominantly European and commercials favoring European descendants. A deviation from this norm is not well received. For example, when the indigenous actress Yelit Saparicio gained prestige for her performance in Roma, there was racial hatred and ridicule thrown against her for many in Mexico. Those of European descent uh, spewed hate, but so did the mestizos, which is very puzzling as a significant percentage of their genetic makeup is indigenous. Colonial brainwashing and divisions have produced a desire for whiteness and a disdain for the indigenous, a subtle form of self-hatred for mestizos. While this has undoubtedly lost power compared to 100 years ago, the remnants are still significant today 
and continue to impact society. So here is a uh, Univision, you know, co-anchor Borja Vo uh, Volsis. So yeah, this guy looks straight up white Spanish. And here's the elite Saparicio, right? And this is a quote from Ben Benson three, Con continuous infusions of whiteness could fully cleanse Indios into whites in as little as three generations, page 48. A new and better day was on the horizon for Mexico through racial mixture. The qualities of the scorned populations, natives and blacks, were not only salvageable, but potentially positive contributors to nationhood, page 31. The fact of the matter is that the illusion of being different due to mixed blood is a racist European concept that was meant to manipulate descendants of native blood. The state was deliberate in this machination, retaining small enclaves of these fully blooded populations as living relics, especially blacks and Native Americans, conveniently served the state's purpose of validating the merits of mixture, a mixture, especially as long as these groups remain in poverty, the state could then use them to juxtapose what were supposedly prototypical black and native lifestyles against those of the racially mixed mainstream, page 37 for Ben Vincent III. In Mexico, the word Indio, Indian, is considered an insult. Cardinal Paul is derogatory as well, cactus nays or having a cactus nose, along with being prieto, which means dark skin. Conversely, having lighter skin is, is exalted and admired. This attitude also stems from Jose Vasconcelos' book of La Raza Cosmica, which views whiteness as, as a quality Mexicans must fuse into by marrying lighter and diluting mixing and rejecting native roots. Only through these infusions of whiteness could the seemingly inferior races advance. As rector of the National University and Minister of Education from 1921 to 1924, it is not a stretch by any means to say that Vasconcelos' philosophy has societal impacts, even if his name is not recognizable to the average Mexican. These are his most anti-Indian and anti-Black quotes from La Raza Cosmica. He also acknowledges how the white race is superior, and he himself was white, a son of European parents. All right, so a couple quotes from this guy. A religion such as Christianity made the American Indians advance in a few centuries from cannibalism to a relative degree of civilization, page five. The stain from the spilled blood still remains. It is an accursed stain that the centuries have not erased, but, what, but which the common danger must annul. There is no other recourse. Even the pure Indians are Hispanized. They are Latinized, just as that environment itself is Latinized. Say what one man, uh, one may, the red men, the illustrious land his from whom the Indians derive went to sleep millions of years ago, never to awaken, page 16. The Indian has no other door to the future but the door of modern culture, nor any other road but the road already cleared by Latin civilization, page 16. Deaths contained in the people of the red man who knew so much so many thousand years ago and now seems to have forgotten everything, page 21. Latin America owes what it is to the white European and is not going to deny him. However, we accept the superior ideals of the whites, but not their arrogance. Page 25. Perhaps the traits of the white race will predominate among the characteristics of the fifth race, but such a supremacy must be a result of the free choice of personal taste. Page 25. The lower types of the species will be absorbed by the superior type. In this manner, for example, the black can be redeemed and step by step by voluntary extinction, the uglier stocks will give way to the more handsome. Inferior races upon being educated would become less prolific and the better specimens would go on ascending a scale of ethnic improvement whose maximum type is not precisely the white, but that new race to which the white himself will aspire with the object of conquering the synthesis. The Indian by grafting onto the related race would take the jump of millions of years that separate Atlantis from our times and a few decades of aesthetic eugenics, the black may disappear together with the type static free instinct of eating may go on signaling as fundamentally recessive and undiscerning for that reason of perpetuation. Vasconcelos, page 32. So this guy, disgusting racist thinking, the black will disappear through this like new mixture, this cosmic race. And obviously he's saying the white people are uh, basically going to conquer the synthesis. They are going to be the predominant product of this. Well, you know, I guess with some mixture from the other races, uh, of course, but the white is the su most superior one. Uh, and this is just really disgusting race racist thinking. And then he was the national rector, uh, or he, what was he? <laughs> Minister of Education, right? Rector of the National University. So this affects everything. This affects the schooling in Mexico, right? And this guy's ideas were not just popular in Mexico. They were widespread in all, the, all these other Latin American countries, uh, the Central and South American countries. So this, this has 
a big impact. This is almost 100 years ago when he was Minister of Education. This has a huge impact. And before that, you had the caste system and all those centuries of hating um, to be indigenous because it was the lowest caste. So, you know, all that, all that piles up, you, you know, that affects society, that affects people's minds, that affects generations, and that gets passed down. So that's what I'm pointing out in this article. And that's what I, that's why I encourage you guys to read bef uh, Before Messi Zahi by Ben Vincent III. And, and please read La Raza Cosmica by Jose Vasconcelos, because you'll be able to see these quotes that I mentioned. Like there is a lot of racist, like pseudo science-y um, BS in there, right? So, and I'm just trying to expose this and to show you guys, this is where I'm pulling, this is where we both, me and Marcus pull our stuff from our facts from is these sources because it's all there. It's not hiding. It's not something that we're making up. We're not a bunch of Alex Jones style conspiracy theorists. This is shit's fucking right there. It's written out in front of you. This was deliberate. It was deliberate. Taken at face value, the cosmic race might appear to be a positive work that is accepting of racial mixture and unions of love. Still its roots are, still its roots are in the desire to dilute the Indian and black out of existence. That, through, that only through becoming wider would a proper new race be born in Mexico worthy of pride and admiration. The cosmic race's main underlying thesis is that any race besides the white one is not worthy enough on its own. Therefore, it makes it necessary to salvage any redeeming qualities. Vasconcelos does say that the white race is not the new, mas the new master race and that the days of the pure whites are numbered, but he views them as inherently superior. He shows disdain for natives and blacks. For these reasons, his work is flawed and negative. These races' notions are hundreds of years of psychological conditioning to hate oneself, turn against one's roots, and to surrender to colonialism as a conquered and defeated people. Fortunately, this system of thought is only a paper tiger. If the mestizo populations of Central and South America united racially as Native Americans, caste divisions could finally be eliminated. The system could then be replaced for an authentic version of the current countries with pride in their ancestral indigenous ties. To this end, I say, I am Indio, soy Prieto, tengo la cara de nopal. I embrace these terms proudly and I don't fit you being, being called this, nor do I care quite frankly. I'm at peace with who I am. I do not hate the color of my skin or my ancestors or my Native American facial features. I do not buy into white supremacy. I urge you to break free from the Spanish caste system's remnants from Vasconcelos and others like him to embrace your native side, if applicable. The goal should also be to stop the discrimination of indigenous groups in Mexico and other countries that retain their tribal identities. Uh, you, you know, because there's various sovereign indigenous nation states within these countries. They are lucky that the Spaniards did not destroy this as well. Having mixed blood does not invalidate a person from identifying with one race, such as Native American, American Indian. We must note the strength of the black community in the U.S. due to their unity as a race. Even mixed or light-skinned black people still call themselves black and are regarded as such. They aren't hung up on the white part of them, some of which is a product of rape, just how some were no doubt created. So, before I continue, this goes, this goes into something that I've brought up in debates before, okay? Where people don't think critically uh, a lot of the times with this. Because I've said before, mestizos suffer for being indigenous. And I've gotten people that chortle and they're like, oh, how? <laughs> I'm just like, you're not thinking about this critically. Let's think about it. Here in the United States, right? You live in Alabama, you live in Tennessee, any of these states, right? And you are... Um, Mestizo, right? What is causing the discrimination? What is causing uh, you to go through hell and grief here, right? Is it the white side, the part from Spain, or is it the indigenous side? <laughs> Let's think critically. Which one is it? It's really obvious. It's the indigenous side. Okay. So, yes, mestizos do not suffer the same as an indigenous person living in an indigenous community in Mexico. However, if they are here in the United States, they suffer in a different way. Uh, there is no prototypical indigenous experience that you have to fit in this box to be indigenous because that does not apply to any other racial group ever. So I just think that's nonsense. Uh, there, and I've, I've had people like come at us and they're like, well, uh, you know, mestizos, they're not, you know, they're not real indigenous. And I'm like, okay, what does real mean? Like, I respect indigenous people, indigenous communities are, that are in Mexico uh, and all these other countries that still retain their culture, their languages, right? That is worthy of respect, okay? I'm not taking away from that, taking that away from them. However, 
mestizos are still largely indigenous. They have that, they, that is still their race. Um, they may not have their tribal identity. They may not have the culture that they might not speak an indigenous language, but why is that? The reason for that is due to colonialism. It's due to forced assimilation. Uh, it's due because their ancestors made a choice to survive, you know, to, to escape discrimination and to survive. And so they mixed or they gave that up and became Christians. And so the blame is placed on, I see this a lot, on mestizos. Now, don't get me wrong. I know mestizos have caused a lot of grief for, for a lot of these in, existing indigenous communities. But that is because of the brainwashing, the colonialism, all that that's brought us to the stage in time. How do you remove that? The way you remove that is by attacking the root cause. Okay, not just the symptoms, the root cause. And that's what we are doing on this podcast. What is the root cause? The whole concept of being separate and superior because you have white European blood. The whole concept of being mestizo. All of that is what's caused this. The whole concept of we're better and we're separate from fully indigenous communities. That's what's caused this for these people that live in Mexico and these other countries. If you remove that element, the discrimination should go away because then you realize, oh, we're not separate people. We're not separate races. We're the same. We are the same. It's just that these indigenous communities still retain their culture and their language. And that's something that should be admired and honored. That's something that, that we should aspire to preserve and to go back to. Um, Cause I know with a lot of these tribes, they are extinct, but they can be revived. They, what, what's surviving, you know, the, the descendants that still carry that blood, um, you know, the, the historical artifacts that, you know, whatever language or words are, have still been preserved, all of that can be preserved, you know, kept in perpetuity basically. And that would only help if mestizos were to go back to those roots. So I'm just saying the solution we're offering is one that solves the root cause of this whole problem. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that out there. Anyways, having mixed, uh, let's see. Oh yeah. One should lean toward identifying with the group that they find purpose with the group that they are treated the same as racist white people don't see mixed natives as white or care about the differences between someone fully indigenous versus someone mixed. It's all the same to them. Even if they are not aware that a non white or non black Hispanic is native American, those are the features of this, like the black hair, onyx eyes, brown skins. This disdain stems from racism, and racism is almost impo impossible without a difference in phenotype. The mix is irrelevant. And I've seen people that retort to, to my statement with this, saying, oh, okay, so we're just going to identify based off what white people say. Uh, because, like, oh, in Mexico, they know the difference. They know it. And it's like, okay, yeah, they know the difference. Uh, but why is there a difference? The Spaniards, the caste system, colonialism, forced assimilation. That's why there's a difference. Uh, that's why that difference seems to matter and why it's caused all these problems. Destroying the whole concept of we're different is what removes that. I mean, like I said, like I, I admire the black community in the United States because you have a lot of mixed black people like Barack Obama, like Alicia Keys, um, like Meghan Markle, and they are all thought of as black. They all work together to get their rights, a civil rights movie, all that. It's a community that works together. They are very racially unified as a people for being black. Doesn't matter. They're not, they're not, they're not 100% black. They're, not, they're only 50% black. And see, I think that's something we can take lessons from, especially for all of us indigenous people here in the United States that suffer a whole lot more because of racism, right? Because of the institutions that um, are sometimes geared against us. And especially those like involving citizenship and immigration. To those self-conscious of being mixed, observe the image of the Mon uh, Monacan tribe recognized federally by the U.S. government in 2018. Other tribes such as the Cherokee request uh, require at least 7% Cherokee blood to be a fully fledged member, or some of them, because there's like multiple Cherokee tribes. This is not to cast hate at these people, but to illustrate my point. In the case of the Monacans, many of their members are majority white, yet they, they do not call themselves mestizo, mixed, or part native. They don't fly simply as natives. The Monarchans and other similar tribes can declare themselves as natives despite having mixed race members. We can true. We can too, right? And and that's that's something I see all the time. Um, I yes, there's still plenty of there's still plenty of northern natives that are pure bloods or have way over 50%. But there's a lot of na northern natives that are in tribes that are majority white 
and they aren't forced to call themselves mestizos. Okay, so I just think it's silly that they are Native Americans, but yet we are mestizos. We're this magical unicorn race, and that I just disagree heavily. I think it's stupid. A common rebuttal to my point is that is that tribes are sovereign nations and race isn't the only factor for membership, so they can define themselves as they see fit. Fit. Fair enough, I respect that, but the government, public, and the U.S. Census do not consider American, in, in, American Indian to be an ethnicity. It is a racial category, and tribe members are regarded as the American Indian race, regardless of how much Native blood they actually possess. For the sake of this argument, ethnicity can't be used as a cop-out when it's convenient and devolves into uh, dishonest double standards and mental gymnastics. Just how, like, that British guy that we covered in that Haters React video, I was like, that's no cool <laughs> That's when it, it gets dishonest. There's power in recognizing the truth and making it known. Those natives are crossing the border illegally. Deport those Native Americans. Doesn't carry the same punch as those illegals, wetbacks, beaners, Latinos need to get deported. Semantics and perception affect everything. Little details matter. Yes, as a writer, 100%. The titles, the wording, all of that has a lot to influence on a person's mind, on and when you, when you combine that with society at large, it is a very big deal to correct this stuff because it changes the whole dynamic of the situation. It changes who has the moral high ground now, who, who's, in the, who's actually been wronged. All of this is a really big deal because some people, um, when I first started this, were like, why, why is this important? Why is it, this is stupid? And it's like, no, not, it's not really stupid. It's, it's not stupid if you think about all the implications and the consequences that goes into this besides just the title of it right it's just more it's way beyond that you got to think big picture i'm no authority on who you should be but a fight for those that don't want to be consigned to a mixed status i fight against those individuals who don't allow mixed people to identify with one race against those that try to take that choice away for many of us i know it can be hell it feels like you're because you're not all in somewhere you're nowhere truly from my personal experience people in the u.s don't respect a mestizo identity they hear the word and their eyes glaze over because they don't realize the significance um, the indigenous side of you is denied to the casual observer thinker and it never registers. This makes it so in effect, you are selling your identity short. You became a foreigner on your own continent. And as somebody that was brought to the United States illegally, I was here illegally for 11 years. That's a big deal to me because I was treated like complete and utter illegal scum, uh, despite being racially Native American. <laughs> But I'm just saying, like, I grew up like that. And so that's why, to me, this is such a big deal. And to see a lot of my own people argue with me and say, no, I'm half white. And it's like, why are you arguing like that? It just makes no sense. It doesn't make sense in me, in the mind of me, a first-generation immigrant that came here. It makes no sense to want to hold on to that. As Jack Sir Forbes eloquently put in his essay, The Mestizo Concept, more significantly to be a mestizo is to cop out, is to accept the Spaniards' colonialist racist ideology. It is to fall supine before the Europeans' racial grading system instead of struggling for psychological liberations, uh, liberation. It is to deny one's own people's history in order to have a masochistic, obscene relationship with the invaders and conquerors. Uh, Jack Forbes was uh, of Powhatan Lenape descent, uh, so he was indigenous himself, by the way. He's an indigenous scholar. Mestizo was first created to differentiate a person from being fully white because of its, because of historical treachery. It became an agent of rejection because being fully indigenous to be inferior, no one desired that, so they chose to flee from that identity. With the background of Mestizo revealed, the choice lies with you and no one else on how you, you wish to identify. I support whatever choice you make. I'll leave you with a challenge with the picture below. Pick out the Latinos and Hispanics from the, from the natives. I'm confident saying that you cannot because there is no difference. We are all one people, racially speaking. Of course, because I've had some people straw man me on this. They're like, oh, so you're saying that there's no difference in the culture? We're all the same. And it's like, we're all the same racially. It's one race. OK, I'm not saying it's all one tribe, one nation. No, it's one race. It's the same freaking race, whether it's north or south. But uh, yeah, I put a couple of these. So my uh, sources is Indigenous Peoples History of the United States. Uh, the chapter C to Shining C, page 117 uh, on the, yeah, for Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz's book. I highly recommend this one. You'll be able to get a sense of everything that happened in the Americas and what Europeans did. It has a big focus on the continental U.S., so you'll be able to see that angle of, of why things are the way they are, the history, the atrocities. It's a, it's a good read. 
the Mestizo Concept Retrieve from a website linked down here for Professor Jack Forbes. If you guys want to read the whole thing yourself, it goes quite in depth. I might actually narrate that article for you guys here um, in the near future. It'd be good. Uh, Casta as Culture and the, and the Sociedad de Castas as Literature, Studies in Voltaire in the 18th Century Norwich by Ruth Hill. So this was cited in Before Mestizaje by Ben Vincent III. I haven't read this whole book, but uh, he cited what she said, so I wanted to give appropriate credit. Let's see, History of Mexico, a captivating guide to Mexican history, starting from the rise of Tenochtitlan through Maximilian's empire to the Mexican Revolution, the, the Zapatista indigenous uprising uh, by Captivating History in 2020. It's a small, really little book uh, that goes over, it's like a brief overview of Mexican history. I read that too. Uh, I have the quote cited for John C. Calhoun for what he said about opposing the All-Mexico plan, Cosmos of Grace by Jose Vasconcelos, and then Before Mestizaje, The Frontiers of Race and Caste in Colonial Mexico, published by Cambridge University Press, Ben Vincent III in 2018. So again, highly recommend these works. Check out these sources. Uh, like I said, it took a lot of time to synthesize this, but that's the whole point of this. Um, like I said, just wanted to read this article because it's pretty instrumental. I lay everything out very neatly without you having to go read five books. But if you want to go read them, go read them. Like I encourage you. Um, and I'll probably do, if I won't do another article, I probably will try to synthesize. Well, I probably will do another article, but I'll try to pull from like in more of the indigenous thing because there is plenty of it, uh, Bolivian indigenous philosophers that knew amount to mention that I'm going to start reading up on. But yeah, again, just to reiterate, Mestizaje, pure invention, pure fabrication by the Spaniards. It was deliberate. It was uh, state organized in the purpose of what that was going to be. It's there. It's not conspiracy theory. It's literally there. Um, and again, the purpose of this podcast is to attack the root cause, to remove that root cause, and then that will have the effect of removing any discrimination that exists against indigenous peoples in these Central and South American countries. And of course, having mestizos finally go back to those roots, including those that are in those South, Central and South American countries so they can finally wake up and reject colonialism and for those living in the United States to um, you know, stop being called foreigners on their own continent like Hispanic. It makes no sense. But anyways, hope you guys enjoy the video. I will see you in the next one. Um, I might not respond to a lot of the comments because like I said, I'll be away for training for two weeks. So I will see you guys when I see you guys. Um, for the haters, you might have to wait. <laughs> Anyways, peace.